Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Microsoft. My name is Radhika Pai, and I lead the uh, Venture Capital and Private Equity Partnerships. Uh, we are very, very happy to partner with Elevation Capital uh, today for this event. Uh, this is something that uh, is part of our long uh, strategic partnerships that we have. Uh, and I think uh, when uh, the Elevation team reached out to us saying that we would really like to understand a little bit more about open AI. You know, is it hype or reality? Uh, what can we do with it? We thought the best way to demystify it is to have an engagement like what has been planned out. So we start uh, with uh, Shiram Rajamani, who's the MD uh, for Microsoft Research. Um, he actually sits out of this building, so it works uh, very, very well for us because it's very difficult to get a you know, Shiram's time, and Shiram has a you know phenomenal presentation to let you all know about what uh, we are doing as Microsoft in uh, generative AI and what some of his researchers are also doing. So, Shiram, over to you. Thank you. What I want to talk about is um, I want to give some sort of more uh, sort of a gut level feel on what this generative AI is about. And I will try to do it with as less jargon as possible, right? So that everyone can understand it. That's my goal. And I want to just present a landscape on the opportunities that are available so as to enable the conversation. That's my goal. Um, but uh, before that, let me just give you a little bit of introduction about Microsoft Research. I have a couple of slides on this. So Microsoft Research is in this building. And um, we got established around 2006. That's around the time we returned from the US. And uh, I was in Microsoft Research in Redmond then, before then, before that I did my PhD at UC Berkeley. And um, currently we have around 80-ish people in this land. We have 50-ish PhD researchers, uh, about 25 engineers and program managers. And our, my colleagues are really stunned. I really enjoy bragging about them. Um, you, know, you can see some of the awards that they have won. I, I want to call, call out a couple. Um, so you might know that the most prestigious award that an end scientist can win in India is called the Shanti Shwarup Bhattanabhi Prize. That's actually the... And uh, up until now, right, they've never given that award to someone who works for an NNC. Right? They've given it to two people in my lab. Right? Venkat and Manik, they're winners of the Shanti Shwarup Bhattanabhi Prize. Um, we have a we have MacArthur fellow. I can tell you, right, MacArthur fellow, I mean, uh, whole of Microsoft, right? Only one person on the car for that, right? That person is from our lab. And um, ACM, right? You may know what ACM is. ACM stands for Association for Computing Machinery. ACM has the highest members, you know, they, they are the ones that give the Turing Award and all that, right? The highest member level is called a fellow. The fellow is elected. India has about eight fellows. Our lab is four of them, like in this building. Right? That's to give you a sense of the uh, star, star cast we have in this lab and so on. I could say more and more about that. But in addition to our um, PhD talent, one of the things we take very seriously is mentoring young talent. That's actually something we do. So in addition to the 80 or so full-time people we have, at any point in time, right, our lab has another maybe around 100 people who are students. Right? So, so, the, so, the, so our, our population is about 80-ish full-time people and about 100, maybe more than 100 actually. And we have, we have about 80 or 100 interns around the year. Throughout the year, we have that. And currently, we have, and then we have postdoctoral fellows. We have around, at any point in time, we have around eight or nine postdoctoral fellows who uh, have just graduated with a PhD. And we are just, in a couple of years, they will just become full fledged researchers. We do training for them. Many of them, after they finish our postdoc with us, right, they join us as researchers. They also go, they become faculty members at IITs, to like If you go to any of those places, and you will see people who have done a postdoctoral fellow with us who are now faculty members. You'll see many of them. Um, and you'll see them in engineering positions in the, in the industry as well. The other unique thing we have is that we take undergrads who have just finished their BS or BTEC, right, or sometimes masters, and then we recruit them on, as one to two year trainees. We call them as research fellows. And this is like a trainee program before they do a, before they do a doctoral program. So some people call it the pre-doctoral fellowship program. Currently we have seven we have 60 such research fellows every year. And from the inception of the lab, right, we used to start small. We only had 10 research fellows at that time. Over the time we have been here, we have graduated on the order of 400. 
they have all now gone done PhDs in top places. Some of them have finished their PhDs and come back, right? And the ones that decide not to do a PhD, right, tend to do better than the ones that decide to do a PhD. They become entrepreneurs. All of us started by one of our others, Mavish and um, uh, you know, I can say like there are, there are many companies that actually our RFs have founded as well. So this is like a very vibrant place, right? You sort of think about it as a place where, you know, people with incredible brains walking around and then young talent that you know, call out the emperor's new clothes and just put, put us to actually, you know, make, make sure that we don't make any assumptions, right? So that's the kind of lab that we have built. So with that context, let me just say what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you some background on what generative AI is. Specifically, what are these large language models? What are these foundation models? I want to give a, paint a picture of the opportunities and challenges that are there in the space. And um, see, I'm a tech person, many of you are business people. So I'm actually hoping that we'll have a conversation about what are the applications. Right? And we can have a conversation about what's feasible, what's not feasible. That's my goal. Right? And I hope to learn from you as well. Let me just jump right in. So where did these large language models come from? So I'm assuming actually most of you have some machine learning background, tech background. Is that reasonable to assume? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, actually, what is, the, I think, what is the audience? The audience is entrepreneurs. Are all entrepreneurs. All entrepreneurs. Right? So you guys are all running companies some, right now. Some, some investors. <laughs> okay, so most mo, uh, mostly founders and employees of companies yeah. and uh, and investors. Okay, sounds good. So, so what are these large language models? Where where where, where, did, where did they come from? This is something that actually most of us who are experts in the field didn't quite expect that this will happen this quickly, right? There's three things that happened, and a confluence of all of them resulted in magic. And let me just deconstruct what those three things are. The first thing is an architecture called a transformer architecture. Let me say what the transformer architecture is. See, before the advent of the transformer architecture, deep learning has been in work for many years now. But the situation of deep learning, maybe five or six years ago, was that for every problem, you needed to have its own deep learning architecture. So suppose you wanted to natural language processing. Then you had your own your architecture for sentiment analysis. You would build your own machine learning model for the sentiment analysis. Maybe you might want to build a computer vision model for object recognition. For that, you would build a different <coughs> architecture. So for every particular problem, then, people were building different machine learning architectures. This paper from Google in 2017 was a real revolution. It proposed one architecture that amazingly seemed to work for all problems. So what used to happen with this transformer architecture was that whether you're doing natural language processing, or whether you're doing audio processing, or whether you're doing object recognition in computer vision, this one architecture suddenly started working for <coughs> all these problems. So this was the first revolution that happened. But that alone, right, was not enough. Because as you know, with supervised machine learning, even if you standardize the architecture, for any problem, you have to collect your own training data and train a model. Right? So for sentiment classification, you have to collect data, which is an input sentence, and the output can be whether it is a positive sentiment or negative sentiment. You have to collect that data. Similarly, for image recognition, right? you need to collect image data and actually what the objects in the image are. You have to collect the training data. And this actually was still quite difficult. Right? So the second revolution that happened is actually something called self-supervised learning. And self-supervised learning is a way to train foundation models without any labeled training data. Okay? So what is it? How, how do you do? How do you train a model without labeled training data? You create a mock task called self-supervision. So this is how self-supervision works. Right? So this, you can see this piece of text here. This is, you, know, you might recognize this from you know, narrow speech. What you could do is that you could sort of create play hide and seek with a piece of text like this. What you could do is actually you could take this text as input and black out one word here, right? And then say, ask the neural network, which is a transformer network, to guess what the blacked out word is. But I already know the answer because I already blacked it out. So I know the answer is twist. So I can say, twist is the label that you now need to guess from this blacked out input, right? I could do the same for another word now. And I would say, I know the answer because I blacked it out. I know the answer is destiny. And I can do that. And I know the answer is freedom. I do that for every word in this piece of text, right? And I do that for every paragraph, every page in a book, right? And every book in the internet, I just do that, right? I could do that for, I could black out portions of images and ask the network to guess the portions of the images that are blacked out. I could do that for every audio file, every video file, right? 
This is called self-supervision. And what self-supervision allows you to do is that it allows you to use the entire internet as training data without any labeling effort. So this is the second breakthrough that happened. Right? The third breakthrough that happened, which was actually even more surprising than the first two, was that you might now ask, right? Oh, for sentiment classification, I need to collect a data set just for sentiment classification. Now you can say you're just doing self-supervision, but how will self-supervision solve all tasks? Right? And again, actually, what we what we realized was that if you add scale to it, there is actually something called emergence that comes, and I'll say something about that, which actually is very general and it solves many, many tasks. Right? That was the third surprise that happened. But before I go there, right, I will actually say that even though these big models, like the open AI models, are trained using self-supervision, what happens is that using self-supervision, they train what is called a base model. That's what we train right now. And there's two other steps that happens where what you can do is actually, you can actually have a base model follow instructions. Say you can ask a question, a chat GPT, you can ask a question. Right? If I ask this question, it should give this answer. That's actually called supervised fine-tuning. You can actually collect some amount of question answer data. But to give you a sense, right, the amount of question answer data that you collect in the supervised fine-tuning model, it's about 1% of the training you do. 99% of the training you do in the base model. And with a small amount of tuning, you can actually teach it instructions. And there's another thing you can do, which is called RLHF, they know you might have something called reinforcement learning with human feedback, to make sure that actually when people use it, they can give feedback on what answers they like and the model will learn from it. Again, that's about 1%. Right? So the base model is so strong that if you give it a small amount of supervision and a small amount of human feedback, right, it aligns itself to whatever task you want it to do. That's actually the reason why it's very general. And actually the scale, and I talked about emergence, this is another thing we didn't expect at all, is that if you see the size of these kinds of models, right, what has happened is that in every generation, the number of parameters has gone by a factor of 10. So in 2017, actually there's something called ELMO, which is 94 million parameters. Then we got GPT-2 scale, which is about 1.5 billion. Then Megatron was about 8.3 billion. Then GPT-3 was 175 billion, and like Palm and so on, 500 billion. And GPT-4, you know, the the model size is not disclosed, right? So it's they became just 10x and 10x and 10x bigger. And what is surprising, again, we didn't realize, is that as the number of parameters became larger, even though we just trained them with these high density tasks for, um, you know, guessing what was what what we hit, these models started doing answering questions when they had 8 billion parameters. They started summarizing text when, when they crossed 62 billion parameters. And about 540 billion parameters, if you give it a natural language piece of text, or if you give it incomplete code, it started completing code. Right? This is actually something that nobody anticipated that they would do. Right? And it is the combination of these three things, the transformer architecture, the self-supervised learning, and the scale, that has actually led to the disruption that we are in today. And because these are general purpose, Intelligent agents, right? They can do many things. Like, for example, the most successful widespread application of it is the GitHub Copilot, where it sits in the I use it. I, you know, if many people in your in your engineering team probably use it, right? If you, inside, you can sit inside Visual Studio and you can write code, and it completes the line. Some, sometimes it completes the entire function. It's done. Is to as to how it can guess what you're typing and it can complete it. Um, and and this morning I was actually looking at you know what this event was about. And I said that actually, you know, it's about how can generative AI help businesses at scale. So I actually asked that question to GPT, and I think it was a sensible answer. Um, in uh, this is big, um, uh, so you can, you know, it's it's pretty stunning that all of these different applications can be answered by the same machine learning model. And the disruption has happened because that prior to this, right, for every machine learning application, you have to build your own model, you have to collect your own training data and you have to build your own machine learning team. Right? The reason why we call these as foundation models is that a single model now is able to solve many, many machine learning problems. Right? And the opportunities are that a huge, this is a huge, we call it the era of co-pilots, because just like I showed the GitHub co-pilot and the Bing co-pilot, no matter what your task is, you can actually communicate with it in natural language, and you get reasonable answers. I mean, the challenge is that because we don't foundationally understand them. This has come just come upon us too quickly. Our understanding of these things is empirical. We can only evaluate it experimentally. We can't write a theorem that says, you know, 
it is not going to send offensive text out. We can't say actually, don't call user name. It's very hard for us to say those things. But we can have only engineering solutions for that. Which is why the copilot model works because in the copilot model, <coughs> the user is always in the loop. We are thinking about the AI as a suggester and the user as a designer. Right? And these models are such high fidelity with the user in the loop, they work really, really well. Right? That's why most applications for you, you will see that these things suggest things and you can tune them with better training and so on to make them very, very good. And you always have a user to, to be safe. Right? That's how we work them. I mean, the other challenges are these are very expensive to train. Um, they are actually both flexible and unpredictable at the same time. So it's actually, you know, that's a, it's an amazing thing about them. And because of that, you need responsibility and guardrails to make sure that, you know, they don't cause harm. I mean, those things are actually extremely important as product designers, right? Those are things that we need to think through when we deploy these things. So with that background, right, let me say a little bit about what the opportunities are. Do, uh, do you want to take a, 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 a brief break about, you know, so far, you know, I've just sort of bottom line described what these models are. If you have any questions about them, you can ask. Maybe I'll take one question or two and then go to the opportunities. Show of hands and I can ask you. Any questions from the audience? On what these models are, yeah. Maybe you are the yeah. So I think in the last couple of months, it's been seen that essentially LLMs trained on code mm -hmm. rather than sort of the entire internet actually perform better in terms of general, generalizable tasks. Like Star Coder is one of them, Revel has its own. Do you have any idea why that's the case? So one thing we have seen is that code seems to teach these models step-by-step -step logical thinking. Because that is what programs do. Programs have a specification in mind of doing something, and the actual code implements that step by step. And these models have learned to understand the correlation between natural language that describes the intent behind the programmer and the step by step reasoning. So, one of the things we now believe is that code teaches these things logical reasoning. Right? And we know that even to perform other tasks, like causal reasoning on text, and so on. That has nothing to do with code. If you train these models with code and also on causal reasoning, it tends to perform much better than what happens when if you train only on causal cause reasoning. So most tasks that involve reasoning, if you train a model with code and then train it with other things, you know it performs better. That is that is our documented experience about it. Yeah. Uh, most of these foundation models, let's say, have been trained at some point. But as humans are interacting, like in the co-pilot one, are they all, like how, how do we make them learn from the user response or whether you took the suggestion you did? Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. I mean, there's many ways. There's something called retrieval augmented generation. You could do many things. There are many, many ways to solve those problems. So we, we this is a note. And I, I'll say a little bit about that, in, you know, uh, when I talk about the second part. So the, basically, the, 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 the remainder of the talk, right, is about three things. I think about something sort of generated way, and the opportunities I think are really. I'd say that if you look again, let's just look bottom line. And there's three opportunities. One of them is actually you could just generate the way itself. You could bring new models, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Right? But this is a high investment, high skill game. If you want to do it, it can be played, right? But it requires incredible skill and it requires incredible investment. But it can be done, right? And I'll say actually what is what is needed to do that also. I'll say a little bit about what is needed to do that. The second thing is that you don't build a model, somebody else builds it. What can you do with it? Right? So imagine actually there's a wave. There's a bunch of people that will build surfboards, which enable other people to surf. Right? You can be a surfboard builder. And that way you will enable other people who are surfing to actually surf on top of the surfboard. So actually I'll tell you what are all the kinds of things you can do to build surfboards and what are the different kinds of surfboards that are possible to build in this way. Right? And the, the question that you asked, right? Is, a, is along those lines. How, if suppose somebody builds me a foundation model, what kind of surf code can I build so that it actually understands my data or it understands my user feedback? How should I do that? That's a kind of surf code. We can build some infrastructure that enables you to build an application that has the property. Right? And the third one is actually some, you know, there's somebody who builds a model, somebody builds a surf board. Now on top of that, you can surf and have fun. You can build it for various applications. You can build it for health, you can build it for education. These are broadly the three things you can do with it. And I'll just tell you, again, just bottom line, what is involved in all these things with no doubt. That's what I tried, right? So let's go to wave generation, right? 
Here, believe it or not, right, the most important thing that we don't know that is needed is to just understand the science of you know, what the hell these things are doing and why are they working, right? And the more you understand them, right, the more you can control them, right? And our understanding of it is at an infancy. And if you are actually interested in this topic, right, there are some papers I would recommend. The one on the leftmost, right, is from my colleagues in Redmond. It's, on, it's called Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence, Early Intelligence with GPT-4. It's an empirical paper about experiments with GPT-4 and inferring what it does and what it doesn't do. Right? It's a beautiful piece of work written by my colleagues in Redmond. I recommend that. Right? The second the work are written by my colleagues in this lab. This one, called Causal, causal Reasoning and Large Language Models, right? Amit Sharma, together with some colleagues, right? he is an expert in causality. Causality is actually about study of cause and effect, but this cause that. Typically, machine learning right, deals only with correlations. In, in, in machine learning, you can't, we can't attribute cause and effects, right? In, in machine learning, we can say that there's a correlation between high temperature and ice cream. But machine learning cannot reason whether ice cream is a cause for high temperature or high temperature is a cause for ice cream. We cannot do that. Causal reasoning can do that, right? Um, and, and actually, you know, as I mentioned, right, transformers are everywhere, but we don't quite know how transformers actually work. We can't actually write a mathematical theorem about this is what they can do, this is what they cannot do. And because of that, right, we can't say, oh, this training is very expensive, let me change the architecture. We, we don't have the ability to do those things, right? So the people who can actually do that, right, they are like gold dust. Because they are the ones that hold the key to how to change this architecture, right? So to play in this game, right, you either need experts or you need investment. I'll tell you why you need investment. Um, because you need a lot of GPUs to train these kinds of things. Right? So most likely, right, if you want to play in this game, you need people who have tremendous amount of expertise, who have spent decades thinking about it, and you, you can't just produce them out of nowhere. Right? Or you need a huge amount of capital to train these models, and I'll actually show you what kind of things you need. Or you need actually ways by which you can take these big models and shrink them into small ones. That also requires tremendous amount of skill. Right? And I'll give you an example of that one. See, in this lab, we have a, a, a group which is actually doing something called extreme classification. Extreme classification is a, sort of think about it like a machine learning classification, but with billions of labels, or hundred billions of labels. Right? In classification, you have an input image and you classify it into a cat or a dog or a panda. Right? But those are labels. But imagine you have a label space which is 100 million, 200 million, and so on. Right? How do you build classifiers with a large number of labels? Right? This lab, we've been building, building those kinds of classifiers because that is what is used if you want to, for example, decide for a, for a query what kind of advertisements we should show. The number of advertisements are very large. <coughs> or if somebody gives an advertisement, right, what are the best keyword phrases to bid for that advertisement? The number of keyword phrases are very, very large. Suppose you give me a, a Wikipedia article, right? What Wikipedia tags should I assign to the target? Right? Those are all large label problems. So in this lab, we have been doing large label classifiers for a very long time. And it turns out that you can combine these large language models together with supervised data from classic, like, you know, in search engine, right? If you've been doing this, you will collect a lot of label data because we know how, what people have clicked on. And as I mentioned, right, with large language models in search supervision, we are not taking into account clicks at all. We are not taking into account labels. We are doing only self supervision. It so turns out that if you take a self-supervised model and combine it with labels from actual users, you can build much, much smaller models for that task. Models that are 1,000th small is actually possible, which are very expensive, very inexpensive to do. But again, right, doing some of this requires tremendous skill to do. I'll tell you another thing, which is these things cost so much GPU capacity. People in this lab have been working on how to virtualize GPUs, right? That's a very, very difficult thing, right? For the cloud exists because CPUs are virtualized. That's the only reason why the cloud exists. But only recently people have been thinking about how to virtualize GPUs. So people in this lab have been thinking about how to virtualize GPU clusters, make them fungible. And the work from this lab is now part of Azure's AI infrastructure, right? So if you want to play things like training, right? You need not only, not only investment on GPUs, but people know how to, who know how to extract the juice of the GPUs. You need systems people to do that in order to train these things. So that's another thing that, you know. So, so that's actually my, the, the, the first part of what I want to say, right? So if you want to play in this wave generation game, you either need people with incredible brains, 
or actually you need huge GPU investment. And people who actually can take these models and dump, you know, train smaller ones that right, can reduce cost. And most likely all of them. Right? That's what you need to actually build this, right? So the second set of things that you that you could do are actually build surfboards, and I'll give you examples of what those are. The first surfboard is in some sense, like, what is the application programmer's model on top of these elements? Suppose you want to build an application. What is the application programmer model? So Azure recently released something called a Copilot stack. Okay? And you may have heard things like Langchain, um, or you know, Microsoft actually something called Semantic Kernel, and many, many things, many orchestration coordination frameworks, right? Where what you do is that, do, do a bunch of things, right? There's a first, there's a pattern called retrieval augmented generation. Then in order to answer the question that you asked, like what people typically do is that, imagine now I have to build an application for health. And I have a amount of health data. And somebody asks a question. What I have to do is that I have to actually, for that question, what part of my data is relevant to that question? I have to actually retrieve that. And then I have to actually add that as part of my prompt automatically. And ask the LLM to ground its answer only within the facts that I have given. Right? And the LLM does listen when you do that. That's how you prevent hallucination. And that's how you actually get the LLM to do what you want to do. Right? And then what you could do is that when the user gives feedback, right, you give answers. And you could those give those you could use those answers to fine-tune your database of facts. So that the next time you retrieve, right, the feedback from the user is actually already part of that. Right? So basically you can actually using a development generation. What you can do is that you can control what these things answer. And what you can do is that you can actually make these large language models only do reasoning. And the way to prevent hallucination is to give it all of the data that you need, that it needs to answer that question, and explicitly ask the model using a meta prompt to not invent anything on its own. That's how you prevent hallucination. Right? And um, all of these you know, frameworks like Copilot Stack, you know, it, it, was, it was released in Build. It enables you to do these kinds of things. It enables you to build retrospective logarithmic generation. And you can sort of think about it as a programming model on top of the LLM. Right? That's how we sort of think about it. I mean, I'll tell you about work from our lab. I talked about retrieval logarithmic generation. You could sort of think about retrieval as retrieval from a memory. So, you know, typically we think about memory as you give addresses and the memory gives answers. Right? So in this AI computer, the way you talk to this memory is using these things called embeddings. Right? You may have heard about the term embeddings. Embeddings is what deep neural networks use to encode every object in the universe. Whether I talk a sentence, or whether I have a picture, or whether I want to capture user behavior, and so on, everything can be captured into a 100 or 200 dimensional vector. That is how deep learning works. Right? And if you have embeddings, then the way you think about retrieval is that all of the facts that you have in the world, you have calculated embeddings for them, and you have stored them as key-value pairs of embeddings mapped to the facts. That's how you have stored them. And now I have a question. The question is also mapped into the same embedding space. Right? Then you go to this geometric space, which you could sort of think about at drawn three dimensions, but in reality it's like you know, it could be 100 or 200 dimensions. And then you find all the other points that are near that point. That is called nearest neighbor. And that's what you need to do. Right? And in order to do this, right, you need to be able to build these things called vector indices, these things called vector indices, right? And um, uh, for, for example, um, uh, I mean, there, there are many sort of startup companies that are out there that do these vector indices. I mean, some of the names just escape me. You may, you may know them. Um, they have a company. But the real issue is scale, right? People like us, right? We have been working with Bing and Office and so on, right? And for a long time, we have been building vector indices that are trillion scale or 100 billion scale and so on, right? And again, building those kinds of scale vector indices right, requires tremendous amount of talent. Right? And the people who know how to build them right, can build surfboards. But if you don't have the talent, right, it's best not to reinvent the wheel and just ride on top of the surfboard and build an application. That's actually a much safer thing to do. So basically, the right, number of advice I leave for all of you, right? Of course, like all of you are entrepreneurs, you should be straight to you, stay true to your customer. You should do that, right? But then, in terms of tech, 
figure out where you want to be in this space. Do you want to be an infrastructure builder? Do you want to be a software builder or not, right? Because this is a high skills game. There's no point in competing with something in which it is neither relevant to your business or might as well just join them, just use them and do something that provides differentiated value. That is number one advice I'll give you is there's only that, right? And so for example, this KNN, you know, you can actually search for it. It's an open source um, scalable vector index from our lab uh, that you could actually it's, it's only pervasively deployed in Bing and ads and so on, and that's actually something that you could use if you want high scale. So let me just show you a third one, a third example of what, what a, 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 a surfboard could be. And this is a very interesting experience that we are prototyping in our lab about can we actually implement a programming environment with no code? Actually, this is it's very a subject of active conversation, right? Many people go to chat GPT and say, oh, write me a Python program to build this website. And I actually write a Python program. I can actually say, oh, uh, convert this natural language into a SQL query. And I can query a database in natural language, right? But the real difficulty with this is actually all of these are actually demoware in the sense that they tell you the happy path. Right? As a programmer, I always know I'm a programmer. So I actually have a happy path. The happy path is where the code works. But and that's what you do in a demo. Right? But the reality is that there are many ways in which it will fail. When it fails, right, can you just debug it in another natural language? Or do you have to go to look at the generated code? That's the only way to do it, right? A thought experiment that we are doing is actually can we build a programming environment where the entire development experience is in natural language? They said, if it doesn't work, I'll have to debug the natural language. How will that look? Let me show you how that will look. We can actually show you. This, this is called actually a programming conversation. Let me show you how this might look like. And this is what we're doing in this lab right now. Um, so what we're doing, doing here is that this is like, think about it like a visual studio, but with only natural language. So the left-hand side, you what is called is a dev chat, where you know somebody is trying to build a game. And they are trying to build a quiz game with uh, history. And they are saying, oh, maybe ask 10 questions. There's no program in typing in, uh, in natural language. And if, what do you see, right? On the right-hand side, a, a natural language program is being written by the other. Right? And the program consists of three parts. It contains variables, it contains some logic, and it contains a knowledge base. That's a particular schema that we have come up with. And it's very stylized natural language. So as people, as the developer types, right, they're saying, oh, you know, let's give, you know, like Korn Benaga Karolpati, we just say, let's give them a 50-50 lifeline. Let's give them uh, a, the ability to skip a question. So we're just making it up. And, and this, this is our program. We're just writing the program in natural language, right? And as we write these programs, right, you can sort of see how the natural language representation is actually changing. Say, oh, now I need this variable, I need history, I and mean, this is my logic, and, uh, and so on, right? But now on the right-hand side is like your execution environment. You now write this program, and I can say, okay, now play this game. And this one says, actually, you know, first generates the first question, who's the first time in India? And you know, it says, oh, now the user says, oh, let me give you a 50 50 lifeline, and it actually takes away uh, two of the incorrect answers and it gives it to you. And so on, and you sort of play it, right? And then you realize, oh, maybe I need um, you know, some more things that I forgot to code. Maybe uh, so far I have not actually given points at all. I, like, one of the most important things about Kornberry is I need to make money, right? That's the, most, that's the fun part of Kornberry, right? So I say, let's give every question some points, like give them some monetary price. And every time, you know, increase it by a factor of 10, so it's exciting, right? That, no, that's all I have to do. So that functionality, I didn't add the first time, right? And when I do that, right, the program gets updated. And it's a national language program. It says, well, now you can see a total question is 10. You can see, like, you know, as a programmer, there are some variables that it has added, and so on. And you can now, uh, and you can actually also say, right, um, and we want to also show the total money the user has won. You just say, just do that. Right? Again, I can just say that in national language. Um, and now we can actually run the program again on the right hand side. So the, so the left side is what we call is a dev chat, the right hand side is like the execution chat, right? Now this, right, to do, and we have done many studies, right? This programming environment, we want non-programmers to be able to just use it. So you don't need to know anything. And it will cover the happy path as well as the same path. Even if the program doesn't work, then you can go edit it, you can do this, and it should be like a programming, right? You can just do that. Imagine actually if this is real, real right? Many more people can actually write applications than actually what people are able to do today. So that's kind of an example. You can sort of see now when it runs, um, it sort of shows you its uh, the monetary price and so on. So I'll, I'll stop this demo right now and, and keep going. Right? Yeah. So I'll, I'll finish real quick now with the applications. I, I think the sky is the limit in terms of applications. You can 
do uh, the FinTech energy language, and I'm sure actually many of you are already doing, uh, probably building such companies, um, uh, verticals, and also societal problems like education, health, agriculture. If you haven't seen it yet, right, I, I recommend you to look at this Khan Nico, which is actually what Khan Academy is doing by integrating uh, you know, these kinds of uh, generative models into Khan Academy itself. Right? You know, when a Khan Academy tutor, uh, previously it used to follow a fixed set of questions and so on. Right? Now actually it can be conversation. When, uh, when you teach a student a particular thing, a student can ask you a specific question in their own terms and it will answer. Right? So that's actually kind of possible. And uh, in some sense, right, what these, in terms of applications, again I'll give one guidance. The first instinct that we have is to bolt on this generative AI in whatever application we have. Right? So whatever application we have, maybe we sort of add a chat to it. <laughs> That's how the bolt on that we do, right? What I've seen is that reimagining what is possible conversationally, right, is probably going to be more enduring. And if you don't do that, right, somebody else will do the reimagination. Right? So better that we disrupt ourselves, it's actually much better than somebody else disrupting us, right? And really thinking putting people at the center, people putting users at the center really thinking about metrics for what benefits users get. Because you know, I mean, this all, I can build shiny objects and I can just do, you know, glitzy demos and so on, right? But I, I would say the most important thing is to really keep your focus on what benefits users are derived. Measure them, right? How many users are happy with answers you give? How many users are not happy with users you give? And what is that you need to improve in order to improve user experience, right? And you meet people where they are. Then I think this technology, and it's possible, you have to do RLHF, maybe you have to do retrieval augmented generation. There are many techniques that you have to build the right self board, you have to do all of that, right? But keep users as number one. You know, then you, all the other techniques are available. Right? That's actually what I would advise you. And, and of course, actually, you know, it's very, really important to make sure that we can provide equitable access, and in order to provide equitable access, right, we need to make sure that we reduce costs for these models, and we reduce costs, right? We need actually, in addition to these big models, we need small models that we train. And those are happening. I mean, there's lots of open source models that are coming up, and so on. Um, and you know, I, I want to conclude by work that we are doing in this lab, together with my colleagues in Microsoft in India, about we've been doing a lot of work on the, what we call the India stack. We've had many, many uh, 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 projects. Uh, I can actually maybe answer more about them in Q and A, and, and you know, be it be it ONDC, be it DEPA, be it Bashing India, very engaged with the government on uh, many of those initiatives. So, uh, so, so I, I think to summarize, right? I think this disruption is here, here, is here now. It's already, it's already here, and uh, um, I hope I gave you a, sort of a, a clear understanding of what these things are, what they can do, and the opportunities right? in terms of generating waves, generating build, support, and actual stuff. So I'll stop here and put your questions out there. Maybe I'll take yours first, and then yeah, yeah. Um, so, talking about equitable models, there's a line of work that tries to uh, reduce the number of parameters, maybe, and try to mimic uh, LLMs and try to build, uh, you know, with fewer parameters. How effective uh, do you think uh, is it to, like, you know, try to build uh, general-purpose models like that? Yeah. So, there's two things I mentioned, right? There's a lot of people I've heard, I hear, I mean, talk to many customers. A lot of people want, to, first of all, they want to find you. And then they want to actually make build small models. There is something that I many things tend to hear, right? Sometimes I ask people, why do you want to find you? One of the things I, I find people are worried is that, oh, if I don't find you, I use OpenAI, all my data will leak. That's actually a real worry. That's the worry. And then they want to find you, right? That is actually not at all worry because there are things like Azure OpenAI. You can use Azure OpenAI. Azure OpenAI gives you confidentiality in the sense that what you do will not leak to anybody, right? So if that is the reason that right, you could use general purpose models, then why, why might you actually want to find you on build small models? Like, there could be two reasons. One reason could be that maybe you don't want to pay the cost. Maybe it is just too expensive. Every call is too expensive, and you want to maybe you want to reduce the cost. What I feel in those cases is that you could actually build find your model, and you could actually build a smaller model. You could distill and build a smaller model. But typically, when you do that, you lose the generality of the model. Typically, the fine-tuned model answers questions on the fine-tuned data that you made, and it will actually, it, its QPS will be better. Right? The number of queries you can actually ask per second will improve because it's a small model. Right? But if your question goes beyond the scope, if the user asks, so the, the thing about the big model is that 
you will now provide su surprising abilities to your user that you didn't, an you didn't anticipate. Right? Suppose it's like, see, on the one hand, we have menu driven software in which we control the user experience. And right? we say, click this, click this, click that. That's, we control the experience. Right? With these conversational models, what we are saying is actually we let the user just say whatever they want. Okay? Now, if you want to offer that promise, right, the way you would build such a system is that you would fine tune a model. But you will know that the fine tuned model will answer only certain specific types of questions. So the way you would have to architect the system would be that we'll have to, we'll have to build a classifier to first decide whether this question is best answered by a, by a fine-tuned small model, and then you're out of that. And if your question is out of scope for that, then, right, it's out of service, <laughs> then you ask the teacher. <laughs> so, so you have to federate it to a larger model. So typically, right, even if you fine-tune, you have to have a large model because at the, without that, right, you lose the generality of the conversation experience. But building a small model is good because it will save you cost. It will let you run on the edge. It will, it will give you more scenarios to run of those things. That's, that's how you should think. And another thing I mentioned, right? what we typically find is that when we fine tune, these models become less alignable. All of the things I mentioned, right, like responsible AI, um, safety, and so on, right? we know that the larger models, we know how to align. The smaller models, we don't know how to align them. This is again in a very good formula. Yeah, we'll, I get you on the yeah, yeah. So in terms of second order effects, I was just wondering where is research when it comes to detecting if a piece of content came from an LLM or a human? And uh, in the same realm of uh, privacy and security, uh, it seems to me right now jailbreaking an LLM is quite easy. And I'm wondering if solving that problem is also tractable because I'm imagining a CIO in a large enterprise, it would be a huge concern for them for adopting. Yeah. Yeah, so, so for the first problem, right, there, are, there is a lot of research that's actually happening right now on just detecting whether something that's produced is um, produced by LLM. There's another thing that's happening in that space, right, which is a lot of the large LLM vendors are now emitting watermarks on their outputs. So because this is now a cooperation, right, it's not like, what we can do is actually the generators can actually put watermarks in what they, and this is already, by the way, happening on videos and so on. Because videos, I think, deep fakes and so on are more of a threat, right? Uh, so I, I think this will happen. Um, already, I think, you know, even without watermarks, you can actually generate, you can actually detect whether something was generated by an LLM, but it won't be foolproof. It is an empirical game that you are playing. And if you ask me, right, the way this is probably going to land is that all the big LLM providers will start watermarking their output, and then this problem will get solved. That's my assessment of how this is going to go. But a second question, I forgot the same question. Uh, jailbreaking. A jailbreaking, yeah. Jailbreaking is getting better, man. I mean, I think, you know, I remember, um, actually, I was talking to the person who does Bing Chat, right? When Bing Chat was first released, and somebody said, uh, many people were able to jailbreak. Now, if I see the incidents and I see a graph on the number of people jailbreak being chatted is going up. So it's possible. We, basically, right, I'll tell you what all people do. Uh, people do things like they start talking to chat in hexadecimal. Right? But the thing understands hexadecimal because it understands everything. Right? And the way the responsible AI framework works is that you put filters on the output, saying don't say offensive things, and then, right? But we, we haven't thought about how to put a filter on hexadecimal. Right, so if somebody <laughs> asks you, talks in hexadecimal, the output will actually escape all our filters. And then they will translate it, and then you know, they say, oh, you know, I managed to do that. Right? So I, I, mean, I know one other person who does the following. They talk to the chat with a dot after every letter. Right? So if you say, hello, right, h dot, e dot, l dot, l, they talk like that. And, they, and it will talk back to you in the same language. And that will pass all the filters. So you know, this is like a, this is a jet break, is like a game that people are playing. And uh, then filters will get better and better. It's like, that's how it's going. Yeah, you get a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah my question is uh, around quality assurance. If you build a product, like you said, on top of the LLM. OK. So the LLM itself is non deterministic Yes. So you can do, let's say, on 100 proms or whatever, you have a tag data and you go through it. Yes, yes. What's the guarantee that that's how it will behave for unseen input data? Yes. One, 
one, one answer is like you take feedback from user, but for a real application, it might be too late because you already showed something. No, it's a very good question, right? But there's a very clear answer to that. The way people do this is by collecting benchmarks, right? And benchmark collection is a very important skill in this world. It is the equivalent of testing. So what you have to do is that just like you invest in any software product, right? You build and then you test. In this case, for testing, you need benchmarks. So for your product, right, you have to own the job of collecting the benchmark. In many cases, the benchmarks are available. Like OpenAI releases many benchmarks, Microsoft releases many benchmarks. Good. There are many benchmarks that are available. Academic community has released many benchmarks. You can start with that. But for your product, right, you have to think, what is the representative interaction that users are going to have in my model? And you have to spend the time and effort and money to create that benchmark. And you have the regression testing and so on that measures it for every evolution, for every retrieval algorithm generation you do, you have to measure. That's the only way. And then you keep improving the benchmark. See, this is what we have to do until we understand the science yeah. of how this is built. It's yeah. a significant investment. This is how you, but there's no other. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the last question, I think. Okay. Uh, so I want to know about the uh, intellectual property issues that's going on. For example, I do understand that watermarking will stop on the other side, but the input side, we know that when it's trained on the open internet, and now looking at uh, issues at Reddit, or I think they're concerned that it's their information that's being scraped. Or I see that all these data sources are becoming a, a closed garden of sorts. So how do you think uh, uh, people, like how do you, how do you make it more uh, egalitarian as such? Meaning, if everyone closes their data, why is the person who is the richest or who can pay is the one who will actually own the model? And, and once you have the model and you have, for example, I think if you get wave generation and building softboards, I think surfing is not an issue. Considering if you can do those two, it's just a matter of acquisition. So how do you see the differentiation? See, again, this will change with time, right? I think what will happen is that I think this is not very different from what happened when search engines came, right? Uh, then there was a model by which, even though you know, a search engine now shows something, the clicks, the, the publisher of the information gets monetized when the clip goes to them, right? I think people will figure out ways by which people who contribute data will either be compensated or the world will, I mean, there's so much data in the world that only copyrighted information will be used to train the LLMs. And the non-copyrighted information will be behind walls and be used to do fine tuning, using retrieval augmented generation. So we, we will probably see a combination of both of those being played out. It's probably what happened. I, I, it's, not, it's not going to be either one. There is going to be a huge amount of data that is present on the internet that these things are going to be trained over. Right? But people are going to have the ability to control their own data as well. And it's the combination between the two that's going to work. That's how problem is important. So we'll stop here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks.